So the title of my sermon is The Cup and the Sword, and uh, it's about the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, to begin with, I wanted to share a little story from my life. <clears throat> and uh, so I live with my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, very elderly, and uh, both have a lot of health issues. And, but this particular week, my mother-in-law was, uh, had very bad knee pain on her uh, because of arthritis. And uh, they both, my mother-in-law and father-in-law both have uh, beginning stages of dementia. So this, it comes out in strange ways. And um, my father, it comes out, what I've noticed is my father-in-law is very directed, how should I say, <laughs> in what he wants my mother-in-law to do. So he wanted her to go upstairs. He wanted to, you know, eat the foods that he thought that she should eat. And, um, you know, she was in a lot of pain. So I noticed when she's in a lot of pain, she doesn't have much of an appetite. But he was very, very forceful. He said, you gotta eat, you gotta eat, you gotta eat this first. And, um, you know, I understood her situation, her, how she felt. And I was, I was telling him, please, you know, don't be so forceful. She's, she doesn't have an appetite because she's in a lot of pain. And, um, but he kept on, you know, telling her to do this and that. And, his voice was raised, and I felt really bad for her, but then I was starting to get angry at him, you know? And then I found myself acting in the same way to him as he was acting to my mother-in-law. So I was telling him, stop being so controlling, and I'm raising my voice, and I know what I'm doing, you know, like I feel in my heart, I know that I shouldn't be angry at my father-in-law. He's, you know, he's 94, he's, you know, he has dementia and, you know, he can't help it, but I couldn't help it. Like I was really just so um, bothered by it. And even as I knew I was going to share this with you, I, I had such a hard time controlling that part of me. And um, you know, that's a little vignette of my life. And I'm sure you can all kind of, um, you know, have stories like that where you, you have things that you know you should be doing, but you can't help it. And that's going to come up in, in the sermon. But uh, so first slide, please. So this is taken from Mark 14, uh, chap uh, verse 32 and 34. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. In the Garden of Gethsemane, there were two contrasting portraits of response to God's will, obedience and abiding by it, or the opposite reaction, doing what you want to do. Jesus revealed what it meant, meant to die to self. In contrast, the disciples, especially Peter, showed the opposite trait. They never said they didn't want to obey Jesus. They were very sincere in wanting to follow his commands and his wishes. The big difference was in how they obeyed. Peter and the other disciples obeyed in a way that satisfied them. They went with their instincts. They went with their gut. And the account of their reaction is a testimony of the failure of human nature to do the right thing, especially in the face of what you don't want to do. 
Today, I want to share with you my thoughts of the contrast between the two so that you can see, one, the beauty of Christ's character, and two, what was the depth of Jesus' sacrifice in the Garden of Gethsemane. So as you've read, as we've read, uh, Jesus went with his disciples to Gethsemane, and this was the night before he was to be crucified. So something I want you to think about, next slide, please, is that Jesus' sacrifice for humanity did not only happen in the cross. Of course, during his whole life was an act of sacrifice, but the actual real part of his dying, it started in the Garden of Gethsemane. That is, that it was not only that Jesus was put on the cross, that the sins of the world was put on him. Being crucified was not the medium in which the sins of the world were put, put on Jesus. The cross was a cruel method of capital punishment that the Romans thought of, but not everyone who was crucified bore the sins of the world on them. Jesus didn't die because of the crucifixion. He died of a broken heart because of the weight of the sin of humanity. In the Garden of Gethsemane was where Jesus started to feel the weight of the sins and thereby the separation that causes, uh, that separation is caused between him and God the Father. That's why it was so painful for him spiritually and physically. God following the final repercussion of humanity's sin was to come to its conclusion. God does not intervene. Jesus is the substitute not because God needs to pour out his wrath on someone for the sins of the world, it's because there was a price to pay for humanity's sin, and Jesus would pay it. Next slide, please. And what was Satan doing at this time? You can bet that Satan wrung the heart of Jesus. When, when Jesus was in such emotional and spiritual distress, Satan whispered to him, why are you doing this? It is for nothing. Look at what your disciples were arguing about right before we came to this garden. They're arguing about who is going to be the greatest. All your years of ministry, of healing in front of them, teaching them, what has that gotten you? Your most passionate disciple, Peter, he's going to deny you. You know that. Your brightest, perhaps your brightest disciple, Judas, he sold you out for some silver. And um, Jesus felt that. This was something that he understood, and it really wrung his heart. Next slide, please. The other one, yeah. So when he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, it's not a, a verbal expression. It's not um, a language, use of language. He literally was so overwhelmed with sorrow that he was about to die. You know, sometimes we use, I'm so hungry, I could die, that kind of expression. This is not what he meant. He literally was so filled with sorrow, with um, pain, that he was uh, on the verge of death. Next slide, please. 
And being in Luke 22, 44, it says, being in anguish, she prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And in this, um, this verse, it may also seem like an exaggeration, but there's actually a physical uh, condition that happens. Uh, it's called hemat hematodrosis. It's a condition in which capillary blood vessels feed the sweat glands rupture, causing them to exclude, exude blood occurring under conditions of phys extreme physical and emotional stress. So this verse uh, reveals how, um, how strained Jesus was when he was sweating drops of blood. It just showed the anguish in his heart. Next verse, uh, next slide. Uh, in Isaiah 52, 14, it says, uh, uh, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. As with many aspects of suffering and the sacrifice of Jesus, this physical aspect of his suffering was prophesied in the Old Testament in Isaiah. And his visage was so marred that his, um, his, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Next slide, please. And what happened next? It said in Matthew 26, 39, going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but you will. When was the last time you heard Jesus trying to question God's commands? Never, right? How hard was it for Jesus that he had to say, may this cup be taken from me? And he said this not just once, but he said it three times. And in the Bible, anything that is said three times shows how significant it is. Next verse. In Luke 22, 43, it says, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. An angel appeared to him. How, did you ever think about how was the angel going to help Jesus at this point? Is it to take the cup from him? No. Is it, it was to tell him that he had to drink the cup and he strengthened him so that he may drink the cup. Next slide. Behold him contemplating the price to be paid for the human soul. In his agony, he clings to the cold ground as if to prevent himself from being drawn further away from God. The chilling dew of night falls upon his prostrate form, but he heeds it not. Next. How dark seemed the malignity of sin. Terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt while he stood innocent before God. Next. Then he returned to his di disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I just want you to note how, of course, disappointed he must be, but how loving and condescending he was to his disciples. When he says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, he really and he really does understand them, you know. 
Okay, next verse, next slide. Three times Jesus asked the Father to remove the cup, and three times he asked the disciples to watch and pray with him. But the gulf of divide of the difficulty of the quest truly emphasizes how hard it was for Jesus and how he didn't try to burden his disciples. How kind and thoughtful was he. Next. The humanity of the Son of God trembled in that trying hour. He prayed not now for his disciples, but that their faith might not fail, but for his own tempted, agonized soul. He beholds its impending fate and his decision is made. He will save man at any cost to himself. He accepts his baptism of blood that through his perishing millions may gain everlasting life. He had borne that which no human being could ever bear, for he had tasted the sufferings of death for everyone. Next. This is a decision that Jesus made to save humanity at any cost. The process in which he makes that decision nearly killed him. But he was supernaturally strengthened by God to be able to bear that weight. How much does he love us to be able to do that? Now, how about the disciples? Next slide. This is what Peter had said when Jesus told him that he will deny him. Although all shall be offended, yet not will I, Mark 14, 27. Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. When Peter says these things, he is not lying. He really means these words. He said them because he didn't know himself, that he was relying on his own moral strength. The only thing that Jesus asked Peter to do for him was to watch and pray. And this he asked Peter to do primarily for Peter's own sake, so that he would not be tempted. But he was filled with moral and e irrational pride because he took satisfaction in his own moral courage. Satan used that to his advantage. When they didn't stay up to pray, you could bet that he caused them to be sleepy and not be able to pray. They could have only fought this drowsiness off by asking for strength from God, but they relied on themselves. Next. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus uses the phrase, let this cup pass from me, to represent the choice that he had to make to take on all humanity's sins on him and to die for them. Cup is a vessel that holds some liquid, usually to drink, usually pleasant, nourishing, desirable, Cup is something that holds something. It is a container. It's something that could be passed or taken. There is a choice. Had Jesus not the choice, then it would not have been able to do the work of the redemption that he did. The Father gave him the cup, but it was Jesus' choice to drink it or not. That's where self-control and dying to self comes in. Jesus had to die to self in the process of making this decision. There was in him an excruciating aversion to sin that was being put on him because he was so pure and sinless that having the sins of the world in his body, feeling, at, and as Eric had said a few weeks ago, it's not as if it was just 
put on him like a sack of potatoes. He felt as if he had committed those sins. That was torture that would have physically killed him had not he not been supernaturally strengthened to withstand it. That's why this decision was so hard because Jesus could have opted out of this horrible experience with one thought, one word. He could have stopped the whole thing and gone back to the bosom of the Father. He had to use every ounce of his self-denial to stay committed to this purpose. Next slide. Peter, when he sees Jesus being taken prisoner, there's a mob of people that comes. And what do they come with? Swords and tools. It is a mob scene. And Jesus is taken captive. The soldiers um, arrest him. And when Peter sees what's going on, the first reaction, he takes the sword that was nearby and he swings it around and he happens to cut off the ear of a servant that was with the mob. But he really meant to kill somebody. He just missed. Um, so his reaction is very much like Peter. Rash, passionate, unplanned. And it's the opposite of Jesus because Jesus held back from using his power. But what Peter did is the opposite of dying to self. He did what he wanted to do. It's easy to say in words, of course I'll never deny you, I'll die for you. But even those lofty claims could not be supported because he was not dying to self. He was inflating himself. He was acting out how he wanted to act. In swinging the sword, he's taking out his aggression and stress. It's almost like a relief. In using the sword, it's the opposite of dying to self because you are acting out your aggressions. Next slide. So just some comparisons I was thinking of, of what uh, this act of Peter is. So when he uses the sword, it's not contemplative, it's just reactive. And it doesn't cost anything, there's no sacrifice. He doesn't need self-control, he's just doing what he wants to do. And it is n not dying to self, it is inflating oneself because he's just acting out what he wants to. And you know, the mob also came with swords and clubs. Their way to use violence and brute strength to force Jesus into submission. Satan's ways are always to use ways in which the person has no choice. He coerces, he tricks, he forces. When Jesus says, when darkness reigns, this is a reference to how Satan has control of the situation. Next slide. Jesus says, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And you know, when he was arrested, it's almost funny, but like he took off the restraining things like it was nothing. And he healed the, the servant's ear that was uh, cut by Peter's sword. And it just shows how easy it would have been for Jesus to not be arrested, not come under the control of being under the mob. It would have been so easy for him to go to the bosom of the Father, and yet he did not for our sakes. Next. 
it's not easy to deny yourself and do what you should be doing. Most of the time, we do what we want to do. In Jesus' life on earth, he had been the one with the Father, doing his will, walking with him, communing with him. But at the Garden of Gethsemane, that communion was separated. In that dark night, Jesus had to make the decision to save humanity at all costs or be in the bosom of the Father. He could not do both. Three times he asked that the cup be passed from him, but three times he was denied. What it took for Jesus to accept the cup and drink it, we cannot fathom. But what we do know is that it took every ounce of self-denial for Jesus to be able to do it. Drop by drop, he was denying himself. Praise the Lord that he was willing and able to do that. For in that decision is how we are able to stand right now. We are able to have peace amidst the sinful world with our sinful thoughts and with Jesus working on our hearts to bring us back to him. How gracious and loving is he. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for who you are and the love that you showed. Lord, we don't know the depth to which Jesus, the pain and suffering that he took as he took, as he took our sins upon him. But thank you. We are not worthy. We don't deserve the many chances that we get. But we thank you for who you are, and we praise you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.